Good morning, everybody. Welcome into the Farzi Show, presented by Destination Retirement, DestinationRetirement.com. Coming to you live from the Steven Singer Studios. Uh, happy Friday, I guess. The thought that I had rattling around in my brain after last night's loss uh, was a sick thought, to be honest with you. The thought that I actually still have rattling around in my brain is that there's, because of the abuse we've been through as Sixers fans over the last couple of years, uh, the heartbreak, uh, past the thigh bowl, quadruple doink, all that fun stuff. Uh, because of all of that, it feels like almost a relief that we're not going to have to suffer through a game seven. This one would be on the road in Miami. We don't have to suffer through that. Instead, we just have to suffer through a game six at home against the Miami Heat, to which the Sixers lost last night, 99-90. to Their season is over. Yet another year of the post-process beginning, I guess, where the Sixers fail to reach a conference finals, obviously fail to reach the finals, obviously fail to win a championship. Uh, Joel Embiid does not get an MVP award, and it's another year that leaves us questioning. And perhaps the biggest difference between this year and any other year was that there doesn't seem to be a lot of hope down the line. The quadruple doink, you thought, Jimmy Butler's here in Philadelphia. Ben Simmons is getting better. Joel Embiid's only going to get better. Oh, man, maybe they keep Tobias Harris. Maybe they keep Jimmy Butler as well. And all will be right with the world. And this will be why we went through the process. Next thing you know, Jimmy Butler's gone. Tobias Harris stays. You make those two acquisitions during that season. You had to keep one of them if you're Elton Brand, considering you already gave up so much in trade value. You're not just going to quit on that trade for one year and falling short of the conference finals because of the quadruple doink. Losing to the Raptors with Kawhi Leonard shot. So you bring back Tobias Harris. Jimmy Butler apparently didn't want to play with Ben Simmons. He didn't really like Brett Brown. And he hightailed it out to Miami where he has now made it to two conference final appearances, as well as one, so far, finals appearance in the NBA. I remember I remember saying uh, when Jimmy Butler left that Tobias Harris better be good and that Ben Simmons better continue to develop. Tobias Harris has been okay, certainly not worth the contract, If Tobias Harris is a much different contract, then we're not talking about nearly as much as we are. But in this series, he wasn't the problem. He wasn't a huge solution either. In the playoffs this year, he wasn't the huge problem. He wasn't the huge solution either. He had more really good games than he did bad games. His defense was constant throughout all the playoff games they had this year in both series. And his offense was what it's been all year. It's been, it was inconsistent. But damn, if you had Jimmy Butler on this team, if you were able to keep that Jimmy Butler 76ers team together, I very much think that you're talking about the Sixers making conference finals appearances and perhaps even finals appearance, at least one, with Jimmy Butler still on this team. And to go back to it, the difference is hope. When Jimmy Butler walked off the court as a 76er, you felt like there was hope. When Ben Simmons passed to Thibel and they walked off the court last year after losing to the Atlanta Hawks in Game 7 of the Eastern Conference semifinals, You felt like there was a little bit of hope still. Maybe this is the butt that Ben Simmons needs to get his act together and develop his offensive game, develop a mid-range game, hit his free throws. Maybe this will be the kick of the butt he needs. Nope. Instead, this just wasn't for him. Philadelphia wasn't for him. He had to get his mental right, as he so hauntingly now said, after that Game 7 loss. I got to get my mental right. We all thought he was just talking about his mindset and approach to the game. Apparently, he meant a lot more than that. So now, where are we? We're with James Harden. James Harden said after the game that he is going to opt in to a $47 million player option for next year at the ripe old age of 33 with uh, hopefully a revamped hamstring. I don't think that really happens at 33, but... I digress. After that, he said he'd be willing to take a little bit of a discount if it means keeping this team together. Not so fast. Let's see how next year goes. Being that's a player option, we know you're going to get $47 million. The guy that played in this series ain't worth $47 million. The guy that has played as a 76er 
ain't worth $47 million for next year in James Harden. And the guy that played in the second half of last night's game, sure as damn hell, ain't worth $47 million. Kevin Nagandi is going to join the show, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you a little sneak peek here. Uh, Kevin Nagandi, we talked last night after the game. He's our guest today. Kevin Nagandi, I think, said it great. Uh, you'll hear him in the interview. He compares James Harden to a, another aging position in a sport where you you age fast, in a position you age fast in that particular sport. And I think it's a great comparison. You'll hear it from Kevin Agani, but I do not have a lot of confidence in what the future holds for James Harden and the 76ers. I don't even I don't even want him back next year, to be honest with you. I think he's cooked. Unless he can realize, uh, because here's the deal, he's going to be back next year. So unless he can downshift it mentally with his mindset and his approach to the game, downshift into strictly a facilitator. And a guy that will shoot the occasional three for you and keep that spacing that Ben Simmons could never do on the offensive side of the floor, then yes, keep him here by all means. You're not going to avoid the 47 next year, but what you're going to do is probably get that discount that he talked about after last night's game. And if he can be that Chris Paul that we talked about a couple of years, a couple of weeks ago, or geez, a couple of days ago, a guy that is just setting up uh, with uh, facilitating the occasional drive to the lane, the end one to go to the line, if he could do all that then I'm fine with it. You could justify it at least. But if he's going to continue to be the guy that's dribbling into triple coverage as he was last night in the third and fourth quarter, then yeah, he ain't going to be the guy that you really need him to be. The guy that's forcing things is not a guy that's anything close to 47 million and certainly not anything close to 270 million. Yeah, definitely not. Definitely not that guy. If I had to put somebody in my crosshairs last night, it's James Harden, above all else, because he is supposed to be the guy to come in here and and be what Joel Embiid can't in this series, which is your leading scorer, which is your playmaker, which is the guy you can lean on, depend on. And he hasn't been. He has not been that. And last night in particular, in the second half of that game, two shots. You mean to tell me that's aggression? You mean to tell me that's trying to make plays for your teammates? Two shots. Uh, I had the numbers, and I want to make sure that I still have the numbers here because this is incredible. Last night, James Harden, most minutes in any half of his career without any points. That's what happened in the second half. It was an elimination game where you're trying to just fight for one more game and hopefully force a game seven where your big man, Joel Embiid, can be uh, one more day of rest because we're going to play till Sunday. And the tank was empty. It was empty really with the entire team is what it looked like. And I, the one guy I do, I don't give a pass to because he still needed to play better. I thought last night was his most aggressive game that we've seen in a while. But Joel Embiid's playing, playing through what he's playing through. Somebody else has got to come here and pick it up. And that's what I've been saying over the last couple of games here. Joel Embiid played well in game three, played well in game four. He was not the MVP man that we have seen play throughout the entire season. He's not the MVP caliber guy that we have seen play throughout the entire season. So somebody else like Tyrese Maxey needed to step up with another 30-point game. James Harden needed to step up with another 30-plus point game. And that wasn't going to happen. Then you lose Danny Green in this game to what is a very scary, likely knee injury that I'm not going to say anything other than that. It's just scary. And you lose him early in the, in the early goings of this game. And you, I, I said going into it, you need him to be the guy to hit the corner threes for you if you're going to stay in this. He's out. Next thing you know, you're d- depending on George Niang, you're depending on Matisse Thibel to hit threes for you. Yeah, that ain't going to work out for you too well. So you look at this game, you go throughout it. James Harden, four for nine, nine shots in total, was three for seven from beyond the arc. So at least his three-point shot was better than normal for him, I guess. Uh, 11 points total in this game, nine assists. That's a small game in 43 minutes for James Harden. Joel Embiid got to the 20 point mark with 12 rebounds. Maxi got you 20 points in this game. Harris got you 12, or excuse me, 14. And off the bench, Shake Milton, the guy I called out last night or yesterday morning, saying that you're going to have to have Shake Milton get hot for you. Yeah, I wasn't thinking 15 points, I was thinking like 10. Uh, but there. That was the only guy off the bench worth a damn last night. I I can't believe that that was an elimination game. 
it looked like one of the games that you had seen from James Harden as the season winding as the season was winding down. I, I'm beside myself, and there is something about when the Sixers lose and they get bounced out early again from the playoffs. There is something different about when they do it versus any other team in the city. In all honesty, because no other team in this city put us through what the Sixers put us through, and a lot of us were okay with it. I said throughout the entire process, I'm not going to devote everything to Sam Hankey. I'm not going to become a Hankeyite by any means. But the, the Sixers need to get out of this purgatory that they have been in for so long. And so they blow it up. They trade Drew Holiday. You realize we are now, with the conclusion of last night, nine seasons. Nine seasons removed from the beginning of the process. Nine. And where are we? Sixers team a year before the process started, went to game seven of the Eastern Conference semifinals against the Boston Celtics and lost. Sixers still have not gotten past that point. They've been to two game sevens. They've been to a game six of the Eastern Conference semifinals, and they have not been able to get past that point. Still, 21 years since they've made it to an Eastern Conference finals appearance. Allen Iverson was playing for the Sixers, as we all know. When the Sixers put us through that process, and again, a lot of us were okay with it. I said, oh, I'll give the same hickey a couple years to try to turn this around. People say, oh, it's still worth it because you got Embiid. No, it's not because, and I'll tell you why. Here's a good example. People have tanked for a great player before. Joel Embiid is a great player, MVP caliber. Finished second in the MVP voting this year. Finished second in the MVP, uh, MVP voting last year. Yes, players, people, the teams have tanked. People, Teams have not gone through a process like the Sixers did for one player. That's a fail. And Jimmy Butler is the guy, as far as I'm concerned, that killed the process. He flat out murdered it. He's the guy that was the straw that broke the camel's back. He was the guy that really the one house of cards, you move that one card, the whole house of cards falls down. That house of cards right there is Jimmy Butler. That one card is Jimmy Butler. Over these nine years, Think about what you've been through. And again, it fails. You get two number one overall picks. Markel Fultz, Ben Simmons, gone. Neither of them here anymore. You get Joel Embiid, yay! Hinky's out. Jerry Colangelo, Brian Colangelo. Brett Brown takes you through a draft where you lose McCall Bridges. They traded him away. Elton Brand comes in. He puts a huge stamp on the process by cashing in a lot of chips. By trading Tobias Harris, or trading for Tobias Harris, trading for Jimmy Butler. Then after Elton Brand comes in, Daryl Morey's here. Nine years. Six different people running your front office. That ain't cool, man. That ain't cool even a little bit. So whenever the Sixers get bounced out of the playoffs post-process and they fail to make it further than they did before the process started and fail again to make it to a conference finals, I think of all the suffering we went through with 18-win season, 19-win season, 10-win season, all that stuff. And I think about, wow, what the hell were we doing? Joel Embiid's great. I love that Joel Embiid's here. But teams have tanked one season for a great player. Teams don't tank three and a half seasons for one player. Teams don't go through six different people running your front office for one player. Franchises don't do that. Teams don't do that. The Sixers did it. And they still haven't advanced past the point where the process started to begin with. And the guy that removed that house, that card from the house of cards to make it all tumbling down, Jimmy Butler, beat your ass in this series. The Sixers chose Brett Brown. They chose Ben Simmons. They said, Jimmy, thanks, but no thanks. See you later. Jimmy said, hey, I don't want to be here anyway. See you later. He still wants to play with Joel B, as we'll get to. We'll let you hear some of the postgame comments uh, in our Rothman Orthopedics postgame report, along with Kevin Agati breaking it down for us as well. But the emotions I'm feeling after this game is just utter disappointment. It's honestly, I'm like, I'm sad at the effort the Sixers gave last night. I'm sad at the fact that they just weren't a better team. And Doc Rivers said it after the game as well. He came to the conclusion they just weren't going to beat the, the Heat, even with Joel Embiid healthy. The Heat were the number one team in the conference for a reason. And I feel like even if Joel Embiid was 100% healthy, it, would, it wouldn't have been some blowout in the Sixers' favor. 
The Heat had an edge throughout this because bottom line was it would have been Joel Embiid against the world. Maybe they force a game seven. Hell, maybe they win in seven, but I doubt it. The Heat were just overall the better team. They, they finally were able to put a showing together last night on the road, the Miami Heat, where they shot 50 or excuse me, 48% from the floor on the road. That had been a big struggle. You had Strauss uh, hitting some big shots for him throughout this series. He had four threes for him last night. Jimmy Butler had a couple of threes as well. Another 30-point uh, plus performance from Jimmy Butler. Averaged uh, about 28 points in this series against the Sixers, so that's pretty damn good. You just weren't going to beat that team. And the reason why was depth. As much as you want to see Joel Embiid out there as much as possible, the Miami Heat were just far too deep for the Sixers. But this loss feels like the worst one. Like, nothing was nothing's going to top the uh, quadruple doink. And watching that go in, it'd be like, no, wait, that can't. It's not possible. But at least at the end of that, a day or two later, there was hope for the future. Last year with Ben Simmons, as I mentioned, it passed the thigh ball. There was still some hope for the development. You know what? Maybe this was kicking the ass Ben Simmons needs. Mm. Obviously wasn't the case. James Harden being here and knowing you're going to have him for at least one more year, I don't have hope. I, yeah, I'm looking at Tyrese Maxey and hope that he continues to develop, but the Sixers are still going to need more. They're going to need more from James Harden. They're going to need even more from Joel Embiid. What's the move? I've talked about Bradley Beal. I've talked about bringing in guys that can help this team uh, get past that point where we've only seen them once in <laughs> 21 years in the Eastern Conference Finals. There's a lot of work for Daryl Morey to do. It's going to have to start with not just adding to the bench, which is a huge need and concern for this Sixers team, especially if Danny Green's not back. You're going to be looking at guys like Thibel possibly being on the move. George Niang not being here. Uh, Doc Rivers said last night, not that he was a huge factor, obviously, at all, even when he was playing in the regular season, Paul Millsap. He could be done. His career could be done. You're going to be looking elsewhere. You have a bolster. You got a bench. You got a bolster big time and a starting five that needs a lot of attention as well. Could Harris be on the move? Harris was beyond honest, by the way, in his postgame press conference. We'll get to that a little bit later uh, about the Sixers effort, but there is just not a lot of hope for me right now looking at this team with all, all the holes they have to fill before next season. And it's just another year where we're looking at it going, well, nine years removed from all the dreck. And this, this is why it stings so much. More than anything else, more than any other team losing, it's because of what you invested. You, you sacrificed any chance of winning for three years. Three years. Sacrifice any chance of winning to get something that would be better than where you were at before. Game seven, Eastern Conference Finals lose to the Celtics with the Andre Iguodala led 76ers. A year later, you have a bad season. You're looking back on it and you're saying, let's blow it up. Hakey comes in, trades Drew Holiday, brings in Nerlens Noel, Michael Carter Williams, and the process begins. Uh, I got a soft spot in my heart for the 76ers team uh, and the fan base because of what you went through to try to get past the point you were at before all this started. And that still has yet to happen. I, I will say, and I'm far from a Joel Embiid apologist. I, I feel like I've called him out in other times where people, oh, he's the best player. He's not the problem. Yeah, I understand that, but he still needs to be better. Uh, but I can say this with every ounce of confidence. Um, Joel Embiid impressed the hell out of me in these playoffs. Joel Embiid playing through what he played through. For all the people that want to talk about how soft he is and he's out of shape and all that, the out of shape thing died two years ago as far as I'm concerned. And the soft thing should never be uttered again by anyone that has one brain cell between their ears. Or more, obviously. Playing through a broken face, playing through the torn ligaments in his thumb, playing through getting a concussion, and then quickly turning it around two games later uh, is pretty damn impressive. And saying he's doing that because he believes in this team and that this team could win a championship. If that's not the guy you want on your team every single night, I don't know what the hell you're thinking because that's the guy I want on my team every single night. 
Does it seem like every year there's a there's an issue, whether it's the Toronto series, yeah, the uh, gastroenteritis, or uh, as we were joking at the time, the hashtag NBA poops. Uh, <laughs> what last year was it the torn meniscus? Yeah, but he still pl- played pretty damn well. Uh, and then this year, a list of ailments. Uh, I, I am impressed as all hell with what Joel Embiid was able to give this team, and a double double again from a guy with those ailments leading your team. Uh, it's a shame that nobody else could step up and try to match that type of energy and that type of uh, commitment. Uh, and it killed me to see him try to play through that with nobody else stepping up trying to help this club. Uh, I want Joel Embiid on here for the foreseeable future because that's a guy I know will play through anything to try to help his team win. And uh, last night, uh, and certainly in Game 5 as well, the Sixers did nothing to honor him in that regard. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the guy that... Uh, is 100% in my crosshairs is James Harden. Uh, before I get to anything with the post-game comments, the first guy I'm going to play is James Harden because you have to hear the way he answered the questions because I think it's very telling uh, for two things. One, his own game. Two, Doc Rivers, his coach, his last game. What James Harden was saying about their offensive game plan after this game, beyond a shadow of a doubt, Doc Rivers, his coach, his last game. I know a lot of people are like, well, yeah, obviously. Well, when you hear the player say it, the way he says it, knowing that player is going to be back, Doc Rivers ain't going to be back. And we'll get into that in a second. But right now, let me tell you about Destination Retirement. DestinationRetirement.com. Michael Seibert. My man Mike Seibert is a retirement income certified professional at Destination Retirement LLC and a partner of 1847 Financial and an advisor for Eagles, Sixers, and Phillies fans only. Maybe next year, Flyers. When it comes to long-term savings, why are you giving up current enjoyment of your income? The answer is to have income streams in retirement. The only way this makes sense is to understand how retirement income streams work so that you can direct savings in ways that give you the highest income when you retire. Think of it like climbing a mountain. The objective is to just get to the top of the mountain. No, it's to get to get safely back down the mountain as well. That's how it works. Going up the mountain is your accumulation phase. Going back down the mountain is your distribution phase. Those are the two different phases of your financial life, and each should be addressed separately. This month, let's talk about college planning. We all know college is expensive, and have you ever thought about how it will affect your retirement? Let Mike show you an efficient way to help pay for your kid's college education and still retire on your own terms. Your first step is to avoid starting your growth cycle over by depleting accounts like 529s for big expenses like college, for instance. You don't want to lose your position on your growth cycle and have to start over. You can't get that time back. Instead, set yourself up with the ability to use vehicles that can, you can take money out of without starting your growth cycle over. Find out how your annual retirement savings can help your college savings and how your college savings can help your annual retirement savings. Mike will show your own portal and retirement analyzer, then use the software to help you navigate through the different phases of your financial life. For questions or to set up a meeting with Mike, email him at GoBirds at 1847financial.com. That's GoBirds at 1847financial.com or call his office at 484-275-6035. That's 484-275-6035. You can also visit the website at destinationretirement.com. And as always, go Birds and play the song. Next year, maybe. Let me tell you about Steven Singer of Steven Singer Jewelers. Ah. Fellas, there's a new thing nowadays called a push present. It's fairly new, I should say. Uh, You want to get the perfect push present? That means your wife just had a baby. Your lady just had a baby. Pony up with a push present. That's how it works now. For my push present, I go to Steven Singer of Steven Singer Jewelers. And when I say my, I mean my wife's push present. Uh, Steven Singer, the other corner of 8th and Walnut, right there on Jewelers Row in Philadelphia. I hate StevenSinger.com, where you could peruse all the inventory and then head on in to the other corner of 8th and Walnut, where Steven guarantees the perfect price every single day. So when you walk in, you don't have to say, uh, hey, Farsi sent me. Although it'd be nice. Go ahead. Tell him I said hi. Uh, but also, you get that perfect price because you don't need a discount. You don't need a coupon. Certainly don't need that promo code. But you get the perfect price no matter who you are every day at Steven Singer Jewelers. So you walk in, they don't say, oh, the sale was yesterday. Or, hey, do you have the promo code? Or, hey, do you have that coupon? No, 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 no. Perfect price every day. You know what else it guarantees you? It guarantees that when you walk in there, there's no hassle. There's no haggle. There's no pressure when you walk in to Steven Singer Jewelers. Other places make you feel like, all right, I got to be on top of my game. Got to negotiate. Got to get this price down as much as possible. No, Steven Singer, you're already set. The guy next to you is paying exactly what you're paying. Because everybody's getting the same deal. Everybody. 
is the, getting that VIP treatment at Steven Singer Jewelers. Other jewelers like to mark things up just to mark it down a couple of bucks in front of you, make you feel like you won some type of prize. Not at Steven Singer. The prize is all over the place. You're good to go. I hate Steven Singer.com. That's I hate Steven Singer.com. One place, one price, the perfect price. Always fast and free shipping at I hate Steven Singer.com. Steven Singer Jewelers, the other corner of Ethan Walnut. Uh, before we get to Kevin Agandi, I want to get some of this post game sound uh, from you guys and, and really let you know what I'm feeling about our boy, uh, James Harden, because I am, uh, quite frankly, beside myself, ladies and gentlemen. I'm beside myself with this team. Here's James Harden after the game. And uh, keep in mind, Two shots in the second half. Two. Two shots. James Harden, ladies and gentlemen, post game. James, just what did they do tonight to stymie you a little bit on, on the offensive end? Nothing. Um, nothing. You only took two shots in the second half. Was there anything Miami did or was it just... Uh, we, we ran our offense, the ball, you know, I feel like the ball moved and, you know, just didn't get back to me. Why weren't you more aggressive? Um, like I just said, we ran our offense, the ball, you know, just didn't get back to me. James, you said the ball didn't get to you. Does the coach call plays to try to get the ball to you? Nice question. Okay. Lot to unpack, as they say. First off, uh, what did they do to stymie you? Nothing. Nothing? They did nothing? So that was just you taking you off your game? Or was it the second half of your, your what your answers were there? Regarding the ball didn't come back to you. We ran our offense. The ball didn't come back to you. Oh, so that's, so that's the coach. You ran your offense. The coach gives you the offense. You run the coach's offense. Ball didn't find its way back to you. Okay. Then he gets the follow-up question. So what you're saying is the coach didn't call plays for you. Next question. Doc Rivers is not back. <laughs> right? That's that's the evidence right there to just solidify the idea that Doc Rivers ain't coming back. And I don't think Doc Rivers wants to be back either, by the way. I think Doc Rivers is done. I think Doc Rivers and Daryl Morey will be like, who would keep doing it? We can't. No? Okay, cool. See you later. And that'll be the end of it. Doc will be playing golf. He'll get another job down the line. But that's it. He's done here in Philadelphia. James Harden all but solidified that for me, listening to him after the game there. Uh, the other thing, again, is the fact that you had two shots in the second half, and that's somebody else's fault. Let's look at these numbers real quick from James Harden. Just, just, just curious. I, I'm just wondering here for a second here. Uh, he had four turnovers last night. Uh, at least three of them were egregious, where he tried dribbling through three different defenders. Uh, I saw Tim Legler on uh, SVP uh, after the game. Highlight one where there was a Victor Oladipo ISO top of the key on James Harden. James Harden, normally, this is a blow-by situation for James Harden. Instead of going crossover, he goes behind the back, takes longer, can't be beat Victor Oladipo off the dribble, ends up being a turnover. Uh, that's not the guy that I want back here for $47 million. That's certainly not the guy who wants a max contract extension, and James Harden did admit after the game that he's not going to be going after that max contract. He's going to take that discount to try to stay here and put this team over the top. Okay, well, before we talk about any money, let's talk about talent. Let's talk about what you could bring to the table here. I don't think there's a much better version of uh, James Harden. I don't think James Harden is going to get better with age. I don't think he's a nice uh, Chianti, okay? I don't think he's going to age well here in Philadelphia. I don't see him all of a sudden changing his game and being more of a facilitator and forgetting the idea that he could blow by anybody. If he does that, then he can at least make it entertaining here in Philly, and we might have to really hope for that down the line because I don't think Daryl Morey brought his guy here for two years. I think he brought his guy here for at least four, four more years. That seems to be more plausible when it comes to Daryl Morey. I just don't see James Harden fitting into that role here in Philadelphia, especially if the only other guy he's got to facilitate to is Joel Embiid or Tyrese Maxey. Tyrese Maxey needs to step up big time uh, in the coming years here in Philly, and let's hope that actually happens. But if Miami did nothing to stymie you, to use the word from the reporter there, then what the hell were you doing? Two shots in the second half. No points. 11 points total. Four turnovers. Nine shots. 
You know going into this game, Joel Embiid is a shell of himself and putting it all out there. And you can do nothing as the guy that's supposed to be the next guy up on this team to try to help this squad win. And it's, oh, it's 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 not what the defense is doing. It's just, it's you're just not playing well. And the defense, the ball isn't finding you again. That's a huge problem because regardless of what the coach is calling, the ball's in the hands of the players. If the players aren't having confidence in you scoring, well, that's a huge problem. And if you're certainly not having confidence enough to shoot more than nine shots throughout an entire game, that's abysmal. And now this guy... <laughs> oh, so what are you going to do now with the, the James Harden? Are you going to release him? No, I'm going to give him $47 million because he's got an opt-in. Not that I think the Sixers are ever going to move on from immediately after that's all they got for the James Harden trade. Uh, excuse me, for the <laughs> James Harden, for the Ben Simmons trade. It's ridiculous is what it is. Uh, now let's hear from Doc Rivers. Uh, let's hear what Doc Rivers had to say about his job securities. Uh, job security. Uh, he said exactly what you would expect. I don't worry about my job, Howard. I think I do a, a terrific job, and if you don't, then you should write it because I worked my butt off to get this team here. When I first got here, no one picked us to be anywhere. Uh, and again this year, the same thing. So if that's how anyone feels, write it, and I, I'm going to feel secure about it. I love this. You write it. You you write it. Yeah, no, no, no. well, we'll or talk about it. Is how it would work for how I was asking, by the way, Howard asking asking the question in case you didn't know. Uh, but for me, I'm listening to that. I'm going, yeah, you're not here. You're not back. <laughs> like, and that was before I heard anything from James Harden. I was just like, you're not. No, it's not happening. Like the aesthetics have gone out the window. See the optics of it. Even with uh, the, the, the James, even with uh, Joel Embiid being hurt, I it. The, does not seem like a good match from this point on for Doc Rivers. And the only reason I've said this a million times, but the only reason I wanted Doc Rivers here, was I thought he'd be the guy that was an old enough, respected head coach in the league with a championship ring that, w- that might be able to reach Ben Simmons and kick him in the ass to get him to expand his game. That was an epic fail. So I see no reason why Doc Rivers should be here. You got a bench full of uh, guys that were going to be head coaches if they didn't go on Doc uh, Rivers' uh, staff, or at least finalists for other head coaching jobs like Sam Cassell, Dave Yeager, uh, Dan Burke. These were all guys that were uh, other teams had interest in at the very least. And now I got to say to myself, um, Doc's out. Who's in? Because the guy could already be here in Philadelphia. Burke was the guy that led the Sixers. Led the six, guy, Burke was the guy that was the coach of the Sixers when Doc Rivers wasn't this season. Uh, Sam Cassell is a guy that's getting a lot of consideration around the NBA. He could be the guy to step up into that role. Uh, we'll see what the Sixers decide to do, but here's what I can all but guarantee you. Doc Rivers is done in Philadelphia. He's not going to worry about it because he doesn't need to. He's doing fine. He'll be on the golf course, whatever, in the next week. He'll watch some film, maybe. Probably not because he knows he's not back. He's probably going to be on the golf course tomorrow. Have a couple of exit interviews. See you later. And that'll be the end of it. Uh, but for the life of me, if you're anybody else in the Sixers team, including James Harden, I don't know how you look at Joel Embiid and not give him more support than what they were able to give him last night and really also in game five as well. Uh, Dan Burke gets a vote here. I see Marquise uh, chanting in here. We'll get to some more of those uh, suggestions in a second. But uh, I think the guy that was the most honest last night uh, was Tobias Harris. And I saw some people talking about throughout this game uh, shooting percentage. The Heat shot 48% from the floor. Sixers shot 41%. Heat shot 25% from three. Sixers shot 32% from three. Uh, The thing that really killed me in this game, as far as I'm concerned, uh, were the rebounds. The Miami Heat out-rebounded you 49-35. to And on the offensive glass, they got 13 offensive boards. That's hustle, man. At home, you can't lose hustle plays. You have to be the hustler. You can't be the hustled. And the Sixers got hustled last night. And Tobias Harris, as much as you might think, between his contract and his level of play, leaves a lot to be desired. At least he was honest with you last night after the game. Here's Toby. No, truthfully, just... uh... Lack of effort on our part, turn the ball over, didn't get the type of looks or shots that we, you know, would have wanted. Um, that was kind of the flow all throughout second half was 
the looks that we were getting just weren't <clears throat> what what we needed to win a playoff game. Um, no, and it's just when I say lack of effort, they beat us on a glass, beat us 50-50 uh, basketballs, hustle plays, all around. Um, yeah, and you know that's not how we wanted to lose a game for sure. Not how you want to end a season either, but uh, like, listen to that. It's like, find the lie. There was no lie. The Sixers knew this was an elimination game, right? They knew in Miami in game five that they had an opportunity to maybe close out the series at home, and they played like dog turds. They played like frowny face poo emojis. Dan Schwartz, shout out. To me, I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I know a lot of it comes to coaching, but if you're a player... Here's here's one thing I will say. Yes, Doc Rivers need to do a better job finding a way to get his team to 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 be motivated. But if you're a player, how do you? What more motivation do you need than looking at Joel Embiid with a broken face come back and play because he believes in you enough that you're good enough that this roster is good enough to play in the Eastern Conference Finals to to play for a championship. If you're anybody on this team and you see Joel Embiid walk back into a locker room, how do you not get motivated enough to try to give that guy effort? To try to play better? To try to beat uh, the balls, the guys off the dribble? How do you not get motivated to own the glass on the offensive and defensive side of things? How do you not get motivated by that? Like if there was ever a series to not look at a head coach and go like, oh, well, this guy's just not going to motivate him. You know what it would be? It would be this series. Because Joel Embiid coming back motivated for two games and other guys stepped up. I referenced Tyrese Maxey before and James Harden, both with 30-plus point performances in game three and four. But from that point on, game five, you don't look at Joel Embiid anymore and go, oh, well, let me, yeah, let me get this guy. This guy's fighting for me. Let me fight for him despicable and i am not the guy to bang the drum for joel Embiid when it comes to oh this guy could do no wrong i've pointed out plenty of wrong joel Embiid has done this is a situation where this guy's fighting through ailments injuries serious stuff that would knock any lesser man out of a game and he's going out there and he's playing his ass off as much as he can considering the situation he's in and nobody else is stepping in to pick him up james harden didn't do it tobias harris didn't do it tobias harris will say this he at least gave you effort in game five especially at the end of game five he gave you effort in those games but good God, man, the consistency scoring, not there from Tobias Harris, not there from Tyrese Maxey, not there from James Harden above all else. And James Harden, you're brought in here to be the guy, to, to, to be a guy that was more like the 1A to the Joel Embiid number one. And he, Harden was far from it, not just in the series, but in the playoffs. Like, I look around this roster, I go, what the hell's wrong with you guys? Guy playing like that, and you can't raise your game to try to help him out despicable uh i mentioned before that uh, jimmy butler is the uh that one card that you pulled away from the process house of cards and it all came tumbling down uh in the future i i remember referencing this two years ago i remember thinking about it like especially when the heat made it to the eastern conference final or made it to the conference final or made it to the nba finals i remember saying on the radio at the time, when we tell our grandkids about the process, Jimmy Butler may very well be the man that killed it. And certainly that's what it looks like. Jimmy Butler did not want to leave Philadelphia. Jimmy Butler felt like he had to leave Philadelphia. Depending on what report you want to believe, Jimmy Butler's talked about it before. Was not a good fit with Ben Simmons, with Brett Brown? And the Sixers decided to put their money on Brett and decided to put their money on Ben Simmons. And obviously that didn't work. I think Jimmy would have played for Brett. I don't think he would have played with Ben anymore, though. Because at least at least Brett Brown had the presence of mind in that series against the Raptors to say, hey, Jimmy, go run my offense. At least he had the presence of mind to do that and knew Ben Simmons wasn't the guy. He was too small for the role. Jimmy Butler, not too small for the role. And Jimmy Butler didn't want to leave Philly. Now, I apologize, a little glitch in the editing here. <clears throat> but uh, this is Jimmy Butler after the game when he was asked on ESPN about 
leaving Philadelphia, or not about leaving Philadelphia, but uh, about what he said to Joel Embiid, his friend and former teammate, after the game. Um, I'm proud of him. Uh, you mentioned the other day that you wanted to win this one so you can have something over Joel Embiid. You just spoke to him. What was that message to him? Um, that I love him. Um, I'm proud of him. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I still wish I was on his team. I definitely love the Miami Heat, though, man. I'm glad that I'm here, but I got so much respect and love for Joel Embiid. And lastly, you mentioned the other day that... No, no, real quick, real quick. Does he say on this team or do you say his team? Because I'm not sure. Either way, that kills me. <laughs> Either way, that eats me up inside. That is the, any gif of like somebody crying, like just throw that out on social media because that's how I feel. When Jimmy Butler says publicly, after he just beat the Sixers, after he just beat Joel Embiid, that he still wants to be a part of Joel Embiid's team, more or less alluding to the idea of he wants to be a Sixer. Because notice he doesn't say, oh, you know, notice he says at the end of that, I want to clarify, you know, I, want, I'm sorry, I love being in Miami. He very much wants to still be playing with Joel Embiid. He would much rather be doing this with Joel Embiid. Because Joel Embiid, you know what? Wants to win as bad as Jimmy Butler wants to win. You know who doesn't? Ben Simmons. That's ultimately the guy that I believe forced Jimmy Butler out of here. Because the Sixers wanted him. Sixers could have given Jimmy Butler the contract they ended up giving Tobias Harris. Oh, did I just mention Tobias Harris? Did the club choose to go in the direction, according to uh, Jimmy Butler, of Tobias Harris? Well, listen to what Miami TV caught postgame as Jimmy Butler was walking off the court into the tunnel. You think Tobias Harris is going to shoot Jimmy Butler a text message and be like, really, bro? Thanks. I'm like, yeah, sorry, man. The got, motion's got the end of the cameras rolling, whatever. Uh, if that's really what it came down to, where the Sixers told Jimmy Butler, we're going to keep Toby over you, then damn, son. Because Jimmy could have got that could have got that contract. Sixers chose to go in a different direction, and I don't think Jimmy Butler wanted to be part of that direction if it meant Brett Brown and Ben Simmons were going to be here. I think he could have found a way with Brett. Hell, Jimmy Butler a month ago was challenging Eric Spolster to fight him. And now where are they? Oh, the Eastern Conference Finals again. So, yeah, I think Jimmy Butler could have made it work with Brett Brown. By the way, we asked Brett Brown about that. Uh, about that. If you remember, uh, I think they were coming back from the West Coast trip, or they were on the West Coast. I think they were about to play Portland. And Jimmy Butler uh, and Brett Brown got into it in a meeting, and, it, and the news leaked out, and they got into it. And, I remember asking Brett Brown about it, and he said he liked it. He said he actually loved it. He loved being challenged by a player, like a guy that gives a damn enough to actually say something. Hey, man, I, I love the idea. I, I wish Jimmy Butler was still here. And that Jimmy Butler team was – let's call it a Jimmy Butler team. But that was, a, that was a fun team to watch. Jimmy Butler had that quality and has that quality, even though he's playing for the Heat, but – while he was here in Philadelphia, he had that quality that some, that some great athletes that have been here for a lot longer, obviously, have had, which is they played the game with the same passion and enthusiasm that anybody in the stands, you pluck them out, you put them on the team, that's the passion and energy and enthusiasm they're going to have. They're going to match that energy. And that's what Jimmy Butler possessed. And unfortunately, we only got a glimpse of it here, less than a season in Philadelphia. Uh, finally, uh, Joel B chimed in on it as well as far as uh, Jimmy Butler uh, staying in Philadelphia. Here is... Uh, Here's uh, Joel Embiid. Also a glitch on this, so just bear with it. Here's Joel Embiid on wanting Jimmy Butler in Philly. I wish I go. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't. I won't sit here and say I wish. Uh, I didn't wish he was my teammate. Uh, I man, uh, still don't know how we let him go. Uh, but you know, I wish I could have gone to battle with him uh, still. But it is what it is. Um, you know, I just gotta. You know. Keep building and, uh, you know, keep trying to wish that goal. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't – I won't. Uh, he just basically feels as we all feel. Um, God, this stings. It stings so bad. One, the lack of effort. Two, the lack of talent. And three, the fact that it was Jimmy Butler again. Four, the fact that it was nine seasons now in the books since the process started. Nine seasons, and still not past the point. Like I feel like I, I feel like the stages of what was it, the stages of grief. 
I feel like I'm at just sadness and depression right now. And I feel like by Monday, <laughs> I feel like by Monday, I'm just going to be at a point where I'll be rageful. Because that's when it'll settle in, and I'm watching all these other NBA, NBA teams play again without the Sixers playing. Cool. We're all having fun. We're all having fun here. Hey, uh, the Phillies won. Uh, hey, the Phillies won, uh, and they blew another seven-run lead. They were up 7-1 in the sixth inning. What could go wrong? Uh, yeah, they won 9-7. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Phillies won against the Dodgers. So that's fun. Phillies won back-to-back -back games. It's been a minute since they've done that. That's exciting. Uh, so I mentioned that. The uh, Eagle schedule comes out. We'll get into that on the other side of uh, Kevin Gandhi here. But uh, I'll also give you what uh, some of my positives were about the Eagle schedule. So we'll get into that when we, after we talk to Kevin. Without further ado, wow, it's almost 7 o'clock already? Damn. Thank you for listening to me vent my emotions, which is pretty much what you guys do every day, and I appreciate that. Um, without further ado, let's jump on the one man. This was after the game last night. Kevin Gandhi caught enough to join us after he put his uh, sweet kids to bed. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, let's talk to uh, Temple University Zone. And by the way, first ever guest of the Farsi Show, the great Kevin Nagandi of Temple University fame and ESPN, joins us on the Rothman Orthopedics guest line. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't get to say this often, but making his triumphant return to the Farsi Show. <laughs> ESPN Zone, Temple Zone, Kevin Nagandi. What's up, Kevin? What's up, Mark? How you doing? We, we've had better nights. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, this was yeah. one of those where uh, you go back and you're just like, you know, um, what could have been? Mm. And I feel like what could have been is, is often used, that phrase is often used when we talk about Joel Embiid's career uh, in Philly. And, and a lot of that, especially the last couple of years, have, Nothing to do with Joel Embiid's performance on the court. Mm -hmm. Certainly. And uh, when I say you make your triumphant return, you, of course, were our first ever guest on the Farsi show. So uh, okay. when I originally booked you to come on, I thought it would be a celebratory thing, not to have the first guest again back, but that the Sixers would win game six and force yet another game seven. Now we're recording this uh, right after that game, after that fateful game six, which at the time we're airing this last night. Uh it looked to me like, obviously, with Joel Embiid being the way he was, not close to 100%, James Harden, I don't know what that was, uh, not having a good bench. It seemed to me that the Heat were going to be the better team in this series, certainly with Joel Embiid and his health taking the hit that it did. But when it came to effort in these last two games, that, too, seemed like it was not matched, certainly not shooting-wise and certainly not rebounding-wise. Overall effort, I can't believe what I just saw from these last two Sixers games. I can't explain game five, especially being in attendance for game four. Game five was inexplic inexplicable because here's the thing. They gave us those they gave us those moments as well in the previous series where and they've done this during the regular season where nothing makes sense. Mm -hmm. And you sit there and you're like, I don't understand what's going on. Uh, but I will say this. When you look at what happened to Golden State a couple nights ago, we've seen blowouts throughout the entire playoffs. I felt like they came to show up, you know, for game six. With losing Danny Green, horrendous. But there was a no-show from James Harden in the second half, and he's been a no-show throughout the series in the second half, aside from game four. And go figure, game four was the best game of his Sixers career. Mm -hmm. So, like, this isn't on James Harden. It's not on one specific thing. There's a lot of factors, but when you lose Danny Green, you lose the veteran shooter from the outside where the offense comes easy. And I said this during the game, nothing was easy for that offense in the first half. It, it, I, and it, it's been one of those things that has been carried over for multiple years where you watch this team and you're like, nothing flows, nothing makes sense. And uh, we saw that tonight. When we saw that in game five. I wouldn't say lack of effort, especially from the big man. Big okay. man oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Lost it. It's just we haven't seen the development from any. I mean, Tyrese Maxey is the only guy we've seen development and growth. We haven't seen that from Cork Maz. I, 
please somebody explain to me what happened to Matisse Thibault in a year. Because <sighs> I, know, I know he's dealing with a leg injury in this game, but his defense has been horrendous. Because mm -hmm. if you're the defensive stopper and you can't score, then you better play defense. That didn't show up. And, you know, we haven't seen the development. Of, Shake, Shake's take, Shake played okay, but he's taking a step back. He's not reliable. For, like, he isn't reliable. We haven't seen any development. And then you look at the Heat and you see Gabe Vincent. Uh, you know, and like you see all these guys develop. They got a $90 million guy on the bench. Because Shrews can hit sh hit threes and play defense, where is that on the Philly team? And we've got that in Tyreek's Maxi. Where is that with everybody else mm -hmm. aside from Joel? I mean, if you're if you're if you're focusing on right now, one positive takeaway from the season, yeah. I think we we knew what we were going to get from Joel for the full season and in the playoffs. Unfortunately, injury happened, but. I mean, Tyrese Maxey is your brightest spot going forward. It's not just building around Joel Embiid anymore. James Harden knows he's going to be back here. He said it after the game. He's going to be back. Uh, Tyrese Maxey is another guy you can look at where could the Sixers team possibly, thanks to him, be developing a not big two, but a big three going forward. Yeah, but you can, I don't know if you could put James Harden in the sentence of a big anything. Okay. I, I, I wouldn't say that. Like, it, it. this feels like a James Harden that can give you – on a good night, 20 points. On a good night. He he can't give you 25 to 30 points. Okay. Um, I, now, I'm I'm more with you now, but it sounds like you're more along the lines of this is 32, 33-year-old James Harden, not just James Harden with a bum hamstring. This is running back James Harden when they're 32. You know, in the NFL, <laughs> when you see a guy who you know, <laughs> the first five or six years at the running back position and then the drop-off at 30, Oof. you know, the measuring stick that Joe Banner and the Eagles had, and they started that years ago. This is that drop-off. You can't, you can't go in every night saying, he's our number two. I don't think you can believe that. He's our mm -hmm. number two. You've got to make him the number three. Now, People are going to call out the trade with Daryl Morey. I will say this. What were you expecting him to do? Now, you had a guy who wasn't playing. And, and if your beef is, is that, okay, you lose Seth Curry, you lose Seth Curry. That plays a role. They could have used a shooter. But you had a guy who wasn't even playing. So you – James Harden does one thing. He could facilitate. And he doesn't play defense. But he facilitates. And then some nights you'll see maybe 18, 19 points. You didn't see anything in the second half. There's no explosiveness. One thing that really stood out and that has stood out the last year and a half, he's not getting any whistles, no matter what it mm -hmm. is. Jimmy Butler was getting the James Harden calls <laughs> throughout the series, right? Mm -hmm. um, there were no calls. Harden, anytime he drove, nothing. Like, so – that's that's the one thing that he his game thrived under, uh, I think, in Houston, especially the last couple of years. And then when he went to Brooklyn, James was smart. I'll be the facilitator. I know I'm not counted on every night to score. I don't have the speed that I used to have. I'll use everybody else. And then every now and then I'll give you a 25-point performance. But I got KD and Kyrie. Now that you're the, the legit number two, you can't do that. Now, he's not – I don't think he's a number two. I think Maxie's a number two, and I'd be curious to see what they do and try to get somebody else. Daryl Daryl will not – and that is Daryl Morey. Daryl will not sit still. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm still a Daryl Morey believer. Some people are not. I am. Let's not forget, he's the one that stole Seth Curry from Dallas – He's the one that drafted Tyrese Maxey. And then what do you want Daryl Morey to do when you got a guy that's not playing? And that is Ben Simmons. You got to mm -hmm. get something, right? Mm -hmm. Certainly. He tried Certainly. Really good to get something. I know people will bring up Halliburton and the, the heel deal. Who knows how that went down, how that fell through with the Kings. God knows, because I think everybody was stunned that those two guys got sent to, to Indiana instead. Mm -hmm. no, certainly. Uh, so looking at this uh, offseason then, it doesn't sound, I mean, it sounds like James Harden is going to be back for the $47 million, opting into that. He said tonight that he's going to opt into that. But when it comes to a long-term deal with James Harden, he also said he'd be open to taking less money yeah. to return to the 76ers, whatever it takes, quote-unquote. Kevin Agandi, whatever it takes, quote-unquote, 
to get this team over the top. Are you buying that from James Harden? Yes, I am. I'm buying that to a certain extent. Okay. I also think that I also think that this plays in a role in who's coaching the team. I think I think that factors into it. And I also think that they've got to get a legit third guy. Um, and does that mean they move to bias? They free up some money? I don't know to potentially get in a conversation and maybe bring in a Bradley Beal and how does that work? I, no one, no one can predict that, but I think that Daryl will be aggressive to find more help from the outside and the spacing and realizing that James Harden that he has now is not the James Harden that we saw in Houston. It's not the James Harden we saw in Brooklyn. We've got a different type of James Harden. Sure. Uh, Sure. The one thing that gets me, Mark, is a couple years ago, this team was built on defense. We sacrificed defense over the last couple of years to get shooters. And those shooters haven't stepped up consistently year in, year out for us when we need them. Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing that I think that Daryl recognized early on. I got to get it. Seth Curry. Seth Curry is a shooter and knew his role, right? Um, Ferk hasn't been that guy. We've been waiting. How, how much longer can we wait? You go, you don't play defense and you can't hit a consistent three, right? I can't explain shake. Cause there's certain times shakes shake is so hot and cold because of the confidence level. Mm -hmm. Um, Niang, we know, we know who Niang is. I actually like Niang cause he's gritty. He's not afraid to miss. No. He's a veteran guy, but if you're expecting more from Niang, like more than 20 minutes, <laughs> You're going to get exposed. Yeah. Danny Green showed you if Danny Green's healthy, this team can stay in games. I mean, shoot, look at the Hawks series. We have them in, in last year. I think we're talking about a different situation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned something about James Harden. I just want to put a bow in that conversation real quick. But you mentioned James Harden when he originally went to Brooklyn, played more of the facilitator role. He had guys to facilitate, too, of course. Can he become a guy that's more along the lines of Chris Paul in terms of? concentrating on facilitating, making sure you're setting up your teammates. Forget about trying to blow by anybody. Set up your teammates and try to hit that three occasionally. Can he be? Can he downshift that game, that mentality, his approach to the game that much to just worry about being more of the prototypical point guard? I think he can. Um, I don't know. Like it, it, yeah, I, When you talk about getting long-term money, you're going to say all the right things, right? <laughs> sure, yeah. It, the the one thing that just that I think the whole city is going to be like I just don't understand is you're an elimination game you have a history and a reputation of not showing up in that elimination game how do you just take two shots in the second half when your team desperately needs you mm -hmm. go down and this city knows if you're going to go down go down fighting and swinging listen if we were looking at a situation where we we wanted our our second started to just take two shots. We had that last year. Where did that get us? Right. <laughs> right. No, no, yeah. It, it got us to a lot of controversy and, and a lot of drama and eventually a trade. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we don't need the number two guy supposedly taking two shots in the second half of an elimination game when Joel needs the help because he's just absolutely exhausted and mm -hmm. on fumes in the final two quarters. Uh, one of the things uh, that was brought up after the game was the offense that the Sixers were running, and that's one of the reasons James Harden didn't get more shots off. He said after the game, and I quote, uh, the ball just didn't come back to me. So he was alluding to the the way the offense was run. He said, we ran our offense, the ball just didn't come back to me. So that makes me focus on Doc Rivers. I wasn't convinced next year was guaranteed for Doc Rivers. Do you think next year Doc Rivers will be the head coach again of the 76ers? I don't. I don't, I don't think he'll be back. Yeah. And I don't think it's uh, like a uh, one-sided decision. And this is not with inside information. Mm -hmm. I just don't think – I don't think uh, – I think it'll be a clean break. They move on, and Maury gets the guy that, that he thinks fits the system. I do have some fear that if it's Mike D'Antoni. Oh, yeah. I don't. I honestly don't think it's going to be Mike D'Antoni. I'm gonna. I'm gonna just wish that into existence that it's not Mike D'Antoni. You want? 
you you got some guys here on the bench that I think would do a decent job. Sam I think Cassell. Sam Sam Cassell's right there for you. Uh, Dan Burke's right there for you. You got some talent on the Dave Yeager's right there for you. You got some talent on this bench coaching next to Doc. And a lot of those guys were linked to rumors of being head coaches elsewhere, but chose to stay on Doc's staff or at least join Doc's staff. Sam Cassell deserves a shot, right? He mm -hmm. deserves a shot. Look at the growth of Tyrese Maxey. Uh, look at the confidence. Um, but I don't know. Like, I I'd like to know the coaching philosophy if they move forward and, and the approach. Because, listen, you've got, you've got a lot of different parts here while the league continues to evolve, right? It's a spot-up shooting three-point league. And look at the roster. Do you have your two main guys as spot-up three-point shooters? Not anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, especially the the guy that you you know you're bringing back for forty seven million dollars. So um, I don't know, man. I I, oh. I just feel bad for Joel. Like it, it's extremely tough, especially when you look at that window. You know, I was texting a, a bunch of guys afterwards that that window from 2015 to 2019, the year after they draft Joel, and the, every decision in that window, you're just like. Oh. He would have done this. It would have led to this. Would have led to this. Every single decision, mm -hmm. and it's not that's that it's not on Daryl's shoulders, right? Because again, I think people seem to Daryl drafted Tyrese Maxey in the twenties, mm -hmm. and he brought Seth Curry. So we we've got to kind of give him the ability to, to. He didn't sign Tobias Harris, and I love Tobias. There's nothing wrong with Tobias. It's the contract that Tobias has, right? Sure, sure. Because uh, I thought Tobias did all he could in, in the in the first two rounds to make sure to prove his value. He was a steady, steady force. Mm -hmm. um, it's a question now is, all right, well, Daryl, here we go. This is These are the parts. What are you going to do? What can you do? How can you make this all work? And then what's the decision at head coach? Sure. No, I, I agree with that. And, and to, to focus on that for a second – we were talking before I hit the old record button here. Um, I don't know where you stood, but I can tell you this much. I was never a hinky-ite by, by any means. I never believed anybody should get a blank check of time to try to work something out. Um, but I said, all right, I'll give this three seasons. It ended up being about three and a half seasons in terms of just utter dreck, no good basketball. Then you finally saw Embiid play a little bit. He played 28 games. That was it. Then you saw the Cole Angelos take over. But basically, oh. now, now that – what was that? Oh. <laughs> yeah so nine seasons have gone by now nine seasons we all know that there's no championships there's no conference finals appearances there's not even getting out of the semi you know, Eastern Conference semifinals Joel Embiid is the crown jewel looking back on it, what now three four different GMs have taken over and a burner gate to go along with it all we have to show for it is essentially Oh, and two of the three, two number one overall picks are no longer here. <sighs> was it worth it? To this point, was all of that worth it for, for Joel Embiid and the chance to build with another trade possibly waiting in the wings of a Tobias Harris, maybe? Well, that is a uh, really challenging question. Um, 2019, you asked me that after the dink, 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 yeah. you know, Kawhi. Sure, things that. things I are looking that. up. I, 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 yeah, it's worth it because you have the potential of keeping Jimmy <sighs> Butler, right? You have the chance to keep Ben Simmons and and with his stock higher than ever before. So you could say at that point it's worth it. Mm -hmm. um, the decision making after that, where you pick in one player over the other, and then uh, you're drafting, uh, you know, one player and then trading them for Zaire Smith. And that player you draft is is basically oh. is is basically a missing piece that that we'd love on our a three and D guy in Bridges. Yeah, sure, McCall Bridges. Yeah, it just it 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 just makes you just uh, bang your head on a wall. Like, um, but I will say, there's a lot of losing, <laughs> and with the unknown of the league, I'd rather be where we're at with the unknown, considering we could have been the Kings. Right, mm -hmm. could have been the magic where you're just stuck in no man's land and you're just recycling coaches trying to figure out is this the year? Is this the year? You, you've got a guy that should have won the MVP this year, and you got Tyrese Maxey. 
right? So mm-hmm. it, it it's really hard to say that right now because the wound is is fresh and open. Yeah. But I would say it it, it was worth it because you got Joel Embiid. Mm-hmm. And, Mark, you had multiple opportunities to get other picks right. But it falls back into what Hinky was saying. You're going to make mistakes, right, in the lottery. You got to hit on a couple of them. We thought we hit on Ben Simmons mm. and Joel Embiid, two foundations. We can't ha- help what happened to number 25. Shoot right. Nets, right? <laughs> Un- unbelievable. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned Joel Embiid, the MVP. Just two quick uh, two quick ones for you here. Did, did Joel Embiid get robbed of that MVP award? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to know... <laughs> And I know a lot of the uh, analytics guys will jump in and they'll yell at me because I'm being a homer. I will just come back to this. If you're winning your second MVP, it's got to be far and away better than the first one, right? Mm -hmm. And then I will say this. Joel Embiid averaged 30 points per game. We haven't seen a center do that in 20 years, leading the, the league in points per game since Shaq. And he did it in 33 minutes. And people will say, you know, Jokic had to deal with, uh, you know, having not having his second best player on the team. But that was because of an injury. Joel Embiid every day, especially in camp, had to set the tone with everybody and saying, he's not here. It's us. He doesn't want to be here. I'm not dealing with it. This is what I'm going to say. I'm not a babysitter. Let's move on. That's a lot more than just missing a player because of injury. You're dealing with drama and the nuance every single day. You've got to carry the team. The dude carried the team, like, day in and day out. And look what he did defensively. And I, it's ridiculous he didn't finish in the top 10 on defense mm-hmm. uh, when it came to the defensive player of the year. The guy plays such a big role in the spacing on the defensive side. Look at Bam Adebayo, who got whatever he wanted the first two games. Mm-hmm. Neutralized uh, the next – you know, every time Joel was on the floor, the final four games. I, I, I don't know what else, and I, to, to, a, to a certain extent, I agree with Joel after game five. What else can he do? What else is he supposed to do? And, again, I know the analytics will go with the VORP and all this other stuff, um, but I, I think he deserved to be MVP. When you look at two-time MVPs, there's a certain select group. I just wouldn't put Jokic in that group. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you this, Mark. Charles Barkley in 1990 got robbed. Should have won the MVP. I, I remember everything about that year. He carried the Sixers. He got robbed. <laughs> he won it then a few years later when he was with the Phoenix Suns. Right. And I'm not saying the league's against us. I'm not doing that. I'm just saying there's a certain impression that, oh, uh, you know, minds are made. People move on. They think James Harden is there. And after what he did in January, they were like, oh, Harden's there now. You know, he's got help. Joel still carried the team night in and night out if you watch that. If you watch Certainly. the Sixers, he carried them emotionally, mentally, and physically. Mm-hmm. No, I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. Hey, the Eagles schedule came out. I'm just going to ask you, what do you got for a record? Are we thinking 11 and 6? Are we thinking uh, 12 and 5? What are you feeling for the Eagles schedule there, Kevin and Gandhi? I'll, I'll go, okay, I'll go a little bit. I'll, 10 and 7. <laughs> but I will tell you this. Ah. The, gap, the gap between the Cowboys and the Eagles is dramatically slim. Mm-hmm. That, you know, listen, we all knew when you look at the talent and where the Cowboys were last year, when the Eagles were, it was like this. I think it's like this. It, it is much closer than you would expect in the offseason because how he made so many smart moves. My only issue and why I think they're only a 10-win team, two issues. We don't know Jalen Hurts, his growth from what we saw the last game. The last mm-hmm. game is on tape for every defensive coordinator. Can he roll left and make the pass across the middle 20 yards? That's accurate. Todd Bowles knew he couldn't. Todd Bowles kept on pushing him in that situation against the Bucks. And if Jalen perfects that and gets better with A.J. Brown across the middle, that intermediate pass changes everything, right? Second mm-hmm. thing, who is playing on the other side of Darius Slay? Like, mm-hmm. that's the issue, right? You can have a ton of cornerbacks that are in their mid-20s that show promise. 
But legitimately, who's the corner? And Steve Nelson was perfect, a little plug-and-play guy, right? Sure, sure. So they find somebody in July and August, like Xavier Rhodes, like, is he the plug-and-play guy veteran? Aside, because I don't know if this current makeup is the difference on this team when we're talking about a passing league and slowing people down. They're going to find the other guy, the other guy. All right, we got Darius Slate. Where's the other guy? And we still need some help at the safety position. We need gotcha. a veteran player that knows what they're doing. So those two positions, cornerback and safety, need to be upgraded in the next three months for me to feel really, really good. But right now, 10-win team in the playoffs – See what happens. I'm okay with all of that. All right, good enough. Uh, Kevin Agon to ESPN. What's the schedule looking like for you these days at ESPN up there in Bristol? 6 p.m. Sports Center each and every day, Monday through Friday. They're going to have a lot of fun with me tomorrow. I don't look <laughs> forward to that. Uh, my co-anchor, Al Duncan, she, listen, she's a Hawks fan, so I can uh, I did deal with it last year. I remember. I remember the banter, yes. Oh, gosh, yeah. And then I got a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff this summer. I can't wait. Projects with – Special Olympics uh, with the NBA finals, uh, with the NBA draft that I can't wait for. So we'll see what happens, and let's just continue to have fun. Awesome. Kevin Agati, you're the man. Appreciate you. Even though the Sixers weren't uh, triumphant, you know, you were triumphant in coming back to the Farsi Show. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you. And listen, let's not forget this guy. Always and forever. You. <laughs> there you go. The good doctor himself. Uh, Kevin Agati, great catching up with you as always. Hope to talk to you again down the line, my friend. Thanks. Be good, Mark. You too. Kevin Agati joining us on the Rothman Orthopedics Guest Line. Oh, sorry about that, buddy. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, that's, uh, I don't know if you, did, did, Jim, did they see you? PJ, did they see it? No, they didn't see it. I was late taking PJ. Yeah, we have a little we have a little meeting usually during the during the interviews there for the people for the people watching on YouTube, uh, not for the people on the podcast. But anyway, uh, that was Kevin Agandi, ESPN great Temple great tech. Kevin Agandi joining the show on the Roth and Orthopedics guest line. Uh, good times, good times talking to Kevin Nagandi. Wish it was about a but better subject matter. Uh, did you the the James Harden comparison to a thirty plus year old running back? I think is very fair. That's certainly what we saw in the playoffs and the latter stages of the season with the 76ers. But let me tell you right now about the great people of Rothman Orthopedics and RothmanOrtho.com. When you have an orthopedic issue, you need a physician who eats, sleeps, and breathes orthopedics. You need an exceptionally specialized Rothman Orthopedics physician because they not only specialize in orthopedics, but they specialize in a specific area of the body so you can have the confidence to get past the pain and be what you were. That's Rothman Ortho. Dot com. RothmanOrtho.com. Make sure you take advantage of their 30-plus locations in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, including four orthopedic-only urgent cares. So that's RothmanOrtho.com. Let me tell you about the amazing people at Freestone Farm CBD. That's Freestone Farms uh, CBD, the best CBD brand because they farm it themselves with all organic inputs, and they offer you some education on how they grow it and how they grow it to make it the best quality products on the market. How would you like 20% off of your CBD products upon checkout? Use promo code FARZY. That's promo code FARZY for Freestone Farms CBD. What's even more exciting, our friends at Freestone Farms just unveiled an all-new strain menu, which oof, has, some, has some supremely good CBD at prices that you'll love. The menu is uh, right there at freestonefarmscbd.com, and it's something you'll absolutely have to check out with strains like their insane tropical Bayox that clocks in at a chart topping 24.1%. A super CBD as well, which is half Hindu Kush and 21%. The genetics of these guys are off the charts. Come on now. And it's all grown, remember, by the way. They're premium hemp flower, hemp flower in the Garden State with all organic uh, inputs and IPM as well. There's absolutely nothing synth synthetic from jar to jar. Farm to jar, nothing synthetic. So use promo code FARZY upon checkout at freestonefarmcbd.com. That's freestonefarmcbd.com for 20% off. At checkout when you use promo code FARZY. Let me tell you about PHL Sports Station, Philadelphia Sports Station, enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience across all social media and blogs. It's phlsportsstation.com. Let's jump into the chat check, ladies and gentlemen. See how you guys are holding up. Cody, what's going on? <laughs> John Cheeseboro. Oh, it's done the thing where it's cut off again. And then Miss Goosey. Uh, there we go. Now we're, now we're popping. Now we're popping. Let me do this thing right here. There we go. The Sixers, Gintus, 
What's up, man? Uh, the Sixers title window closed today. Marquis, Sixers got more softies than dogs. I'm done with Tobias, too. Uh, it's not Doc's fault. Stop blaming him. It's the fans' fault. Ben was a treasure. We didn't celebrate him only in Philadelphia. We wouldn't treat Pop this way. Doc earned it. No more dumbass questions. God bless you, Dan Schwartz. This roster with Tobias and Harden window is closed, in my opinion. Marquise Tobias uh, been a no-show, but making $180 million. What a joke. Thanks to the, thanks for the shout-out, Dan. You're welcome. You're welcome, Dan. Thanks for the shout-out. Uh, I wish I was the poop emoji. I feel like <laughs> Dan Schwartz is saying, if I was the poop emoji, I would feel less like crap. Sixers are magical. The Sixers are magical. They have the ability to make a man feel more like a piece of poop than the poop emoji itself. Feels like a piece of poop to finish that thought. Clay, uh, I think it's hard to motivate multimillionaires. Uh, my holy king. What's up, man? Butler wanted a fat paycheck. You're right. They gave that fat paycheck to Toby, though. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Clay, someone please post a list of all the processed bums that we've had. Uh, wow. Wow. Jimmy is speaking the truth. April, it breaks your heart, doesn't it? No, no it breaks mine. Pete, good morning. April, good morning. <sighs> yeah, but the, you know, that's what compounds it, Gentess. I'll tell you this right now. It's easy to say keep Jimmy now over Ben. It is. You're absolutely right. But that's part of why I accept people's fury when it's directed at Ben Simmons. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. Because you invested so much in Ben Simmons. Money, obviously. Number one overall pick, definitely. But then to make decisions to keep him happy along the way, like Jimmy Butler, that's rough, man. That's rough. And it stings. Uh, ba -ba -ba, Maholy King, Gentis, Dan, April. Yeah, extra farzy today. You're welcome. The first Farsi guest, Kevin, back before Mark Swede Habit tripled. Thank you, Mally. <laughs> uh, dee -dee -dee. Oh, boy. Uh, Tony, what's up, Tony Wiley? What's going on? The Heat showed you how you really build a team. The process was a complete failure. Yeah. That's why people like, again, was the process worth it? Was the process uh, a success? Yes, yeah, because you got Joel and beat. No, no, no. If you just tanked and got Joel Embiid, that would be a success. If you just tanked and were able to acquire assets like that, then yeah, that'd be a success. But a whole process of three plus years, yeah, no, I ain't successful. Uh, let's see here. Why do bad things happen to good people? Me, says Alex. I don't know, Alex. I wish I could tell you. D. Douglas Vickers. What's up, man? Uh, Niang sucked throughout the playoffs. Niang supposedly had a, a knee injury, and I'm not making excuses for the guy, but I'm just saying, like, I, I wasn't expecting a lot from Niang to begin with. And when he got the knee injury, I, I'm not ex like, if, if he's offbeat that much uh, and he's not hitting threes, I'm not expecting anything else from George Niang. Uh, so yes, yeah, so that definitely hurt the Sixers. Niang's play overall, bottom line, hurt the Sixers in the playoffs. Uh, trade Embiid while we still has we still has value. I'm not there yet. I, I know. I know some people are. Um, J Love 47. Yeah, uh, you're not the first person to say that to me. I am not in the camp that says trade Embiid just yet. Frank, what's going on? Let the idiot Colangelo come in and take a dump on the process. Then they were so when they were so close. This is the result. I mean, it, it does kind of feel like that. Um, Dan Schwartz, if you really want to piss off, check out what Ben Simmons put up on Instagram as soon as the game ended. He's the biggest loser. Oh, did Ben Simmons put something up on Instagram? I didn't bother to check. Damn it. Now I'm going to do this, and we're going to go through more pain and suffering because I hate joy. What's his name? Ben Simmons. And what's he do? That's old. I'm not seeing anything on Ben Simmons' account. I'll check Twitter. Da -da -dee, da -da -da, ben Simmons. Not Summers, Farzetta, you fat-fingered idiot. Simmons. 
Why? Come on. Come on, Boomer. Use your phone. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not seeing anything, unfortunately. Uh, maybe he took it down. Maybe the story is already gone. I don't know. Seventy Sixers curse Philadelphia sports teams. I don't know if you could say that. I mean, the process started. The Eagles won the Super Bowl. Process still going on, I guess. Joel wants Bradley Beal. You damn right he was. And by the way, Joel Embiid did say after the game. We'll get to this stuff on Monday, just because we'll talk more about the future. Joel Embiid did say people were expecting James Harden to be the Houston James Harden. He's not that guy anymore. Thank you. Uh, Jim Grassmeter, what's up, buddy? Nice to have you. Jay Love, nice to see you in the chat. CBD is legit. Farzi, I ordered some from Freestone Farms on Tuesday. Ben, Sim ben Timmons. Way to be, Ben Timmons. Way to use that promo code. Wow, I get to listen on the way to work today. Great start to Friday. And that that and the Bo ja Jangles. Ooh, you're having some Bo Jangles. Are you there, April? Good for you. Birds can take Dallas for the division. Uh, Mike, I totally agree with you. Uh, Ben's uh, Ben put up Jimmy's pick. Maybe that was old. Ben is a chump. <laughs> Sean, I agree. IG, look under Ben's tagged posts. All right, let's see here. Ben tags. Seeing a jacket. Oh, deja vu in Philly. Oh, zero four. Oh my God. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think Ben has anything to do with that. Wait, nine hours. Oh, Ben's tagged. Yeah, but I don't think this is Ben doing anything. <laughs> Yeah, okay, Dan just tagged me in on Twitter as well. Oh, that was last night. Oh, God. Gosh, dang it. Oh, no. Let, oh, I got to... Uh, Barstool. Okay, thanks, Dan. I'll retweet you. Retweeted. Thank you. That's horrific. That is absolutely horrific. Hey, you know what? Let's just talk about what's important. His mental health, folks. This is helping him get over his mental health, apparently. But Philadelphia wasn't the problem, by the way. And Philadelphia chose Ben Simmons over the guy that he has the picture of behind him, which who is Jimmy Butler. Is it like what is what are you bragging about here? Ben, you're the reason that Ben that Joe that Jimmy Butler isn't here. Jimmy Butler didn't want to play with you. You didn't want to play for Brett Brown. Like, what the hell, man? What? Where's? Why is this a brag? You didn't even play. Do you even recognize the sport that's going on behind you? Because you don't play that sport anymore, and you're smirking. If this, uh, like, this is one of those things that I'm like, this isn't photoshopped, right? Ah, oh. damn. This is the beauty of. Uh actual sports is getting to uh watch this getting to put it all together trying to figure it out now barstool philly hasn't put it out let me just check regular old barstool uh, i'm looking for ben on the barstool people on the podcast yeah here it is yeah for the people let's see if you can let me see if i can if you guys can get this on camera on my awesome phone yeah you see jimmy butler in the background, on the phone, Ben Simmons up front, just smiling. Thank you, Dan. You know, I was going to sleep at some point today. <laughs> ah, this is fun. This is fun. This is fun. God, I hate Ben Simmons. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, that was our uh, chat check. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's move into our morning rush. Brought to you by Sky Motorcars, skymotorcars.com. Philly's back at it today against the uh, Dodgers. 
10 10 start time today. They won 9 to 7 last night despite blowing another 7 1 lead. They, this one they won. Bryce Harper had three RBIs, which is nice. Kyle Gibson gets the start against Clayton Kershaw. That'll go great. Clayton Kershaw is only 4 and 1, or excuse me, 4 and 0 oh on the season with a 180 ERA. Uh, Kyle Gibson 3 and 1 and a 294 ERA. So there we go. We'll see how that shapes out for the Sixers, or excuse me, for the Phillies. Um, and yeah, that's what I got for you. Uh, oh, so, oh, Eagles schedule real quick. I said I'd get to this. I got them in an early 11 and 6, people. 11 and 6 for the uh, Philadelphia Eagles on the schedule. Uh, one of the things I liked in this schedule, is that coming up? Uh, one of the things I liked in the schedule. Oh, it is fake. PJ? Fake? Thank God. Okay. Uh, that schedule's not coming up. I don't know why it's not coming up. That's really frustrating. Anyway, uh, I got the six. There it is. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I got the Eagles, uh, 11 and six in the early goings of all this. I like the end of it. We'll talk about it more on Monday. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Hey, in there, Sixers fans. Uh, let's say maybe the Phillies are going on hot streak, right? Uh, help distract this. Maybe. No. Okay. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Jim Hyden produced the program, did a phenomenal job as per usual. It's a Buzz Sports Entertainment production. My name is Mark Farzetta. This is the Farzee Show presented by Destination Retirement, destinationretirement.com from the Steven Singer Studios. Have a great weekend, everyone. Take it easy.